Our next keynote speaker is the state senator for California's 17th district, which includes Morro Bay. He previously served as secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency. It's with great pleasure to welcome Senator John Laird to the stage. Well, good morning. Uh, glad you're all here. And uh, this is an amazing conference. I salute everybody that has been working on this. Uh, it's an amazing collection of people together, and I know I spoke at the Energy Commission forum yesterday briefly, <clears throat> and there was a town hall meeting with over 200 people in Morro Bay last Thursday night. So I'm very excited to be able to not speak in bite-sized pieces and try to line out what's going on in California and what our challenges are with offshore wind. Uh, last year, we had one of the most amazing years we have had on climate in the legislature and with the governor since possibly the adoption originally of AB 32 in 2006. And that bill put us in the lead by taking the Kyoto Accords and enacting them for California. And we met that goal. We were supposed to go to the emissions of 1990 by 2020. We met that goal three years early. And now we have moved on to higher goals in shorter amounts of time to really try uh, to move off fossil fuel in the next 20 to 25 years in California. <clears throat> so last year, we put into statute many of the goals that had been created by executive order. We did interim goals so that we know where we will be every five years against where we want to be in 2045. We did uh, amazing things with electric vehicles, with with billions of dollars in the budget and try to deal with accessibility issues, uh, both financially and physically. Uh, we did with well capping, high road labor agreements, a uh, uh, whole host of things, uh, carbon capture. And we also, the governor wanted to extend the life of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, the only one remaining operational in California. And a lot of that ties into wind, which, which I will talk about in a, in a moment. But also, uh, with that, was a billion dollars uh, in elect, uh, renewable electricity that the state was incenting uh, as part of that deal. And um, I, uh, at the time, called for a Marshall Plan uh, for renewable electricity in California that led to that as the first tranche and about which offshore wind is involved and said, and I'm supposed to, to do this, so it's on the record, that in 1947, Secretary of State George Marshall called for a plan to promote world peace and natural interest after the desperation and chaos following World War II. The conditions of climate change, including historic droughts, floods, fires, and ocean acidification, are of equal threat to worldwide political stability and economic health, as well as to global ecology. So our response to climate change demands a revolutionary approach like the Marshall Plan. And with its ambitious renewable energy goals, California is on track, but now we have to implement those goals. Uh, offshore wind is an essential part of the implementation plan and a quintessential element of the climate change revolution. And so in addition to what we did last year, the year before, the legislature adopted Assembly Bill 525, uh, which set forth a strategic plan that's due this summer and had the Energy Commission actually set electricity goals for offshore wind. So with all that as a prologue, now in California, we are moving to implementation. And now our challenge is not setting goals uh, uh, not lining out where we should be. It's actually doing what we need to do to get there. And so <clears throat> there's issues. Many of you are familiar with some of them, but I want to really highlight the issues that we have to address to do that implementation. Uh, the first one is permitting. And California has strong environmental laws that have uh, been historic in the last half century. And so 
the real challenge is, is how do we protect those laws, but how do we make sure that the laws actually work, that the process moves in a reasonable amount of time, and that we use that to hear from the public. And the Diablo Canyon uh, bill last year gave us a template because there were real calls to override uh, environmental permitting. At the same time, there were calls from many uh, environmentalists to not touch the permitting process. And what emerged from Diablo Canyon is the Coastal Commission, which really is, is a primary uh, land use permitting agency for California, will not have its permitting authority overridden, <clears throat> but they have a fixed time in which to exercise it. They have to exercise it in six months on Diablo Canyon, and I think that was an elegant solution, and it points the way to what we might think of when we try to move uh, to permitting on wind. And then we have the big issue of siting ports. And in Humboldt, because there's the two lease areas, in Humboldt, that's not the issue that it is in my home area on the central coast. And so over the last few months, there have been three different studies released, one by BOEM, the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management, at the federal level, one by the State Lands Commission at the state level, and one by REACH, which is a coalition of local organizations at the local level. And each had some differences. Um, and I think the key thing is, because <clears throat> we have the, uh, the issue in the Central Coast that we have at least 1,500 jobs from Diablo Canyon that we'll be phasing out, and that is a real economic engine locally. And we hope that there will be jobs from offshore wind phasing in, that, that those two things will help each other, but it doesn't necessarily match up with, with what is needed where for a port in the right way. So, so the BOEM uh, study and some of the others supported really that there are three functions in doing this. The, the largest staging and integration would require 100 to 150 acres. The medium manufacturing and fabrication would be uh, maybe 10 acres and an 800-foot wharf, and the smaller operations and maintenance site, <clears throat> maybe 5 to 10 acres and a 300-foot wharf. And so rather, uh, uh, the BOEM study talked about the fact that large ports in California, Humboldt, uh, Los Angeles, and Long Beach were best suited and uh, those three and three others, Stockton, Richmond, and San Francisco, might be uh, candidates for the medium-sized port, but San Luis Obispo and others, but San Luis Obispo could be a site for the local operations and maintenance port that you don't look at it necessarily a, a, as one thing because of the logistics and hauling and things back and forth. And so uh, that is really... Uh, a challenge for us moving forward, and it is as much a political challenge as a logistical challenge, and we want to make sure that it works, and it's a challenge now because it has to be done in a time frame uh, uh, for when to come on. Then we have the issue of transmission, and uh, the uh, Humboldt is a, uh, uh, an issue all by itself. Uh, that part of the state is really where the grid isn't uh, strong in being connected. There's gonna have to be some major work, but in the Central Coast, part of the uh, agreement on Diablo Canyon, there, there was pressure to extend it in an open-ended way, or even extend it past 2025 for 10 years, but uh, the arrangement was is that it only be extended for five years to have the transmission ready at the time that wind comes in off the coast. And so we still have the, to sync that in the right way with however a wind moves ahead, but we're trying to address the transmission issue that way, and the Diablo deal spoke to that. 
<clears throat> then we have the issue of wildlife impacts. And that is a big issue for some people. It's, I've had a, a long letter from the Morro Bay fishing industry about 23 impacts that they believe will, will happen on the central coast. When I was in Denmark looking at their wind about a month ago, they had extensive research that they put online, but of course, uh, 20 miles off of California and Denmark are two different uh, uh, ecosystems. There have already been scientists from the Monterey Bay hired to look at certain of the impacts, and it will have to be addressed in, in the EIRs. And uh, it, there is concern, but it is my expectation and hope that those will be addressed in the, the EIR process. But that leads to the last one that I really want to highlight. And the last issue is really about the public. As became clear at the Morro Bay Forum last Thursday, the public is really new to this. Uh, most people in this room have probably been working this for a while, talked to themselves, talked to other people that are in the industry, but we haven't fully brought the public along yet. And whenever that happens, there's anxiety, uh, sometimes very free-floating, and, uh, uh, and we have to address it. We have to make sure that people understand what the impacts are. I had to very clearly say at that forum, uh, because it focused a lot on ports, well, it's really the leases have happened, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's the ports, there's the transmission, they're all different parts of this issue in a way that they could sort of uh, think from, from leasing and manufacture to the point that it, it comes into somebody's home as electricity. What are all the things that need to happen and how do they work? And there was even a pushback at that forum from somebody that uh, um, didn't fully uh, accept that climate change was going on. And so uh, we're going to have to deal with all those. We have to bring them along. And they were most worried about whether or not they were going to have a seat at the table when all these decisions were being made. Because uh, uh, for different ports that aren't those mega ports that already have a footprint under established, there's real issues. There was proposals for a couple of Central Coast ports to consider platforms over the ocean. The people in Morro Bay are very concerned about the estuary and how it's a natural ecosystem and whether or not this was going to be uh, uh, disrupted by something that might happen in Morro Bay. And it really is about guaranteeing that people get a form of education and understanding that they have a seat at the table and they feel like they're participating in the decision because that's the way they will buy into this going forward. And it is a, a very important. And I think sometimes, uh, uh, and this is developers across segments, not just with wind, they, they start with the assumption that this just works and everybody's on board. And you can't make that assumption at the beginning. You really have to, the truth is in the middle somewhere there and how we do it. So now that on the state uh, puts it upon us in the next period of time to tie all these things together and coordinate them and provide the leadership to do what it takes that this happens in a timely fashion. It's really going to be port siting. Uh, it's gonna be the permitting. It's gonna be the transmission. It's gonna be making sure the wildlife impacts are looked at. It's gonna be bringing the public along. And in the ideal world, we're talking about <clears throat> wind coming on shore in seven years. We gotta make sure that happens because the clock is ticking and this is one of the biggest tranches of renewable energy that California will be able to develop against its goals. So, <clears throat> I am working and intend to continue to work with other legislators and the administration and the regulatory bodies. I think we have to do a level of coordination that isn't 100% evident yet uh, uh, to make sure that we get there. But uh, we're committed. And I think uh, the, the one last message is when we did AB 32 to put the Kyoto Accords in California, 
We set the goals and people criticized us for saying, you don't have a plan to meet the goals. Well, we set the goals and it forced everybody to plan. It forced everybody to develop and we met that goal early. So I appreciate the chance uh, to have been here. I look forward to partnering with you. I wish you success in, in developing WIND and working together to get there. So good luck in the program and in the development.